And we have a request for practice number three. You've observed the following returns for Bennington Corporation stock over the past five years. 18%, negative 14%, 20%, 22%, and 10%. First thing, when you see something like that, my assumption is we're going to put this in the calculator to find the mean and the standard deviation. And sure enough, A is the mean, B is the variance, and uh, B2, why not C, I don't know, is the standard deviation. So let's look at how we do this. So here's our calculator. Um, what am I going to do first? Second clear work. Okay, well, second seven, and then second clear work. Because you've got to get all that old data out. So then we start typing these in. Now, oh, for shame, he's late, Mr. Murs. Okay, now, here's the deal. Because I know they're going to be asking for variance, I'm going to put these in as decimals. If they were not asking for variance, I would not put them in as decimals. I just put them in as regular percents. And by the way, that percent key on your calculator, if I could take an X-Acto knife and pop that off so you would never use it, I would be pleased to do that. Because that percentage key does nothing but cause terrible, terrible pain and anguish. Ms. Roll, can you, uh, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> don't use a percent key. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to put in there uh, 0.18, by the way, you can always use decimals and always be right. 0.18, enter, arrow down, arrow down. Uh, by the way, I skipped Y1, did you see that? X02, I've got 0.14, negative, common mistake, not to put the negative in. 0.2, oh shoot, I don't want to do that. Clear, clear, clear. Uh, so all I have to do is like this because I didn't hit it. Arrow down, arrow down, X03 is 0.2, enter, arrow down, arrow down, x04, 0.22, enter, arrow down, arrow down, x05 is 0.1, enter. Now here's what I like to do. I like to arrow back up through there and make sure that I got all my numbers right. And if I don't, this is my chance to fix them. Okay, what do I do next? Um, second, eight. Second and eight. And now what do I do? Arrow down. Arrow down. And it says n is equal to 5. It's a good thing to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to make sure that you didn't have extra stuff hanging out there that you didn't erase. Arrow down. X bar is 0 0.112. What's that? That's the mean. Yeah. And so uh, multiply that by 100% gives me 11.2. Now then arrow down gives us the standard deviation and that's the one that we want, sample standard deviation. I multiply that by 100 and that gives 100% and that gives me the answer to B2. But can anybody tell me how we're going to get variance? Yeah, all we got to do is square it. Now check this out. When I hit square, that equal sign is going to go away. That's the calculator's way of letting you know this is not a number that I calculated. This is no longer correct. Uh, it's a number you calculated. So this is going to be, oh by the way, would we multiply this by 100%? No. Absolutely not. We're going to leave it as it is. Uh, now you say, oh, wait a minute, I, I want to know my standard deviation again. All you got to do is arrow up, arrow down, and bada bing, bada boom, you're right back where you were. Questions? Okay. Now we're moving on to number four. Okay, stock has returns of 10%, 17%, 26%, 14%, negative uh, 14%, 24%, and negative 9% over the last six years. What are the arithmetic and geometric returns for the stock? Well, I could put these into that stat thing, and it would give me the arithmetic mean. Or what's the other way I could find the arithmetic mean? Add them up, divide by six. Okay, so let's do that. Clear. We're going to say, and I could do, uh, I could do the whole percents this time. Uh, plus 17 plus 26 minus 14 is the easy way to do that. Plus 24 minus 9. Equal. I'm getting 54. Is that what you guys are getting? Mm -hmm. Good. Now, how do I get the average? Divide by what? Six. six. Yeah, I divide by the number of observations, which is six, and that gives us that nine percent. Easy peasy. Now, let's look at the geometric mean. 
For geometric, we always have to use the decimals. For geometric, we always have to use the decimals. For geometric, we always have to use the decimals. And what we're going to do is we're going to add one to each one of those returns. And then we're going to multiply them all together. And then we're going to take that product to the what power? One to the six. One divided by six, right? right? Yeah. One over six. And then what are we going to do? Minus one. Minus one. And then our last step will be to multiply by? 100%. Okay, so here we go. Um, and what I'm going to do is for each one of those terms, I'm going to do the 1 plus the return, and then I'm going to store it. So I'm going to have six things that I'm going to store, and then I'm just going to multiply those together. Okay, here we go. 1.1. 1 .1. Do you guys see how I got that? Okay. Um, store 1. 1.17. 1 store 2, 1.26, store 3. Now here's where it's hairy. 1 minus 0.14 equal, and what should I do with that number? Store 4. Yeah, store 4. And then 1.24, what should I do there? Store 5. Store 5. And then what do I do for the last one? 1 minus. 1. One minus point oh nine, nine equal. And then what do I do with that? Store six. Store six. Okay, what do you think we're gonna do next? I don't know. Ooh, not add. Yeah, very good. Recall one times recall two times recall three times recall four times recall five times recall six equals. Now what's the next step? Y-X. Yeah, we're going to have Y to the X, and then what do we do? Open parenthesis. 1 divided by 6. 1 divided by 6. Close parenthesis. Equals. Okay, uh, two more steps. What do we do next? Minus 1. Minus 1, very good. Minus 1 equals, and then what do I do? Times yeah, multiply by 100%. That gives me that same answer. Any questions? Okay. Now we're moving on to the chapter 10 homework. Stock has returns of 3, 18, 3%, 18%, negative 24%, and 16% for the past four years. Based on this information, what is the 95% probability range for any one given year? If I say probability range, what should you immediately think of? Yeah, the normal distribution. And where is the 95% range? It's between plus and minus two standard deviations. And so what we're going to need to know to solve this thing is the mean and the standard deviation. So how am I going to use those numbers I've got up there at the top to get mean and standard deviation? Um, second, seven. Very good. So I'm going to go to uh, clear second, seven. Now this time, we've only got four. Previously, we had five. So if we don't clear that, we're going to be in a world of hurt. So second, clear work. What do I put in for x0, one? 3%. Yeah, we can just put in 3, and I'm going to go whole numbers, and here's why. Because as long as the mean and the standard deviation are in the same units, we're perfectly fine, right? Uh, it's when you start getting around with this, and, and the mean and the standard deviation should always be the same units, right? If we get into variance, that's where it gets hairy. So, uh, what I'm going to do is just say 3, enter, arrow down, arrow down. What should I do for number 2? 18. 18. Enter. Arrow down, arrow down. X zero three. Twenty four negative. Enter. Arrow down, arrow down. And then sixteen. Enter. Now we're going to go back up through, make sure we got them all right, because sometimes you forget to hit enter. And the calculator's not going to tell you that. So go back and verify all that. What should I do next? Second eight. Second eight. 
And I'm going to arrow down. Four, we know that's the right number, that's good. And then we see that the mean is 3.25. And we said it's going to be plus or minus two standard deviations. So we need to figure out what the standard deviation is. So I'm going to just arrow down and I'm getting 19.35. So 2 times 19 of uh, 0.35 is 38.70. And so 3.25 minus 38.70 is equal to minus 35.45. Is that right? And then 3.25 plus 38.70 is equal to 40, basically 42, right? And so there we go. That's how we get there. Questions? Should you have the normal distribution on your note sheet? Yeah. Yes, sir. You could sum it in as decimals. You could. You absolutely could. And then at the end, you could multiply by 100% and be just fine. No worries. You can. So decimals will always get you the right answer as long as you remember to multiply by 100% when you get done for mean and standard deviation. So, yes? So for everything we just put like the whole number not in decimals unless we're doing the geometric. Um, um, unless, if it's being uh, added to one, you got to do decimals. Okay. If it's being multiplied by something, you got to do decimals. But like this where it's just asking for the standard or the normal distribution, it's easy enough just to use the regular numbers. But you know what? If you're not sure, use decimals. If you're not sure, use decimals. By the way, it took me years to get to where I could do no which is to which. So I was in Dr. Witte's, I know this is going to blow your mind. I was in Dr. Witte's investments class at Mizzou. He was the professor there. And he, uh, I, I did the security market line. And for my risk-free rate, I had percentages. And for my uh, market risk premium, I had decimals. I have never been more embarrassed in my entire life. Here I am, a doctoral student sitting in our undergrad class, and I got hosed over by this whole decimal percentages thing. If you can't get it straight in your head, always use decimals. So far, my most viewed lecture video on YouTube was where the thumbnail was you guys, because apparently you're much better looking than I am. Okay, next one. Let's see, that was number eight. Okay, go ahead. When, if you use decimals, when do you multiply by 100? Is it before, before you do the plus and minus? Oh, so what I would do is, so you could do it either way. So this would be 0.0325. Mm -hmm. You could multiply that by 100. Uh, this would be 0.387. You could okay. multiply that by, it doesn't matter, right? doesn't matter at all. And if in your head you can look at a decimal and see the percentage, then you don't have to do it at all, right? Right. The reason you multiply by 2 is good. Symmetrical size. Exactly. Plus or minus two standard deviations gives you the 95% range. Because remember, uh, plus or minus one, 68%. Plus or minus two, 95%. Plus or minus three, 99%. Always have that crap on your note sheet, though. Questions? Okay. A stock had returns of 8%, 39%, 11%, negative 24% for the past four years. Which of the following uh, best describes the probability that this stock will not lose more than 43% in any given year? Oh my goodness. So, uh, what's the first thing we're going to do with these numbers? Find the mean. Yeah, we're going to find the mean, the standard deviation. So, I'm going to say clear, second, seven, second, clear work. And once again, because we're just finding mean and standard deviation, perfectly fine to do it as decimals, perfectly fine to do it as whole numbers, doesn't matter. So I'm gonna go with the whole numbers, eight, enter, arrow down, arrow down, 39, enter, arrow down, arrow down, 11, enter, arrow down, arrow down, and then 24, negative, enter, I think that's it. And so then I'm gonna go back and make sure that they're all in there, and they are. And then what's the next thing that I do? Yeah, second and eight. What do I do now? Arrow down. Arrow down. So it's telling me I've got four data points, that's right. I'm gonna arrow down, 
and I have a mean of 8.5. And I'm going to arrow down one more time, and I've got a standard deviation of 25.77. Okay, now this thing says, what's the probability that you will not lose more than 43% in any given year? So this is the time right now when we're going to roll out T to see how many standard deviations away we are from the mean at negative 43. By the way, how did I know it was negative 43 and not positive 43? The word lose. The word lose. And so I'm going to say t is equal to minus 43 minus 8.5 divide by 25.77. And so that's going to give me minus 51 and a half divide by basically 25 and 3 quarters, which is going to give me, I think, 2. Does that sound right? Yeah. So we're two standard deviations below the mean. Now, we know that there are 95% of all observations between plus and minus 2 standard deviations. So how much is actually below negative 43 then? 2.5. Second? 2.5. 2.5. Why not 5? Yeah, because we got two tails, right? We got two tails there. And so we know that 2.5 is below 43. But read the problem. It says, what's the problem? It will not lose more than 43%. So the probability it's going to lose 40, more than 43% is 2.5%. What does that mean about the probability it's not going to lose more than 43? Yeah, just 1 minus 0 0.25 gives us a 97.5%. Does that make sense? Okay. Can we also just do 100 minus 2.5? Yeah. Yeah. You can do the whole numbers, you can do the decimals, but just don't do, just don't mix them like I did in Dr. Whitty's class. We actually started off decently warm in here, and now it's getting cold. Oh, wow, this is a classic. Okay, now, the first thing to note about this problem is that those dividends have a tiny little decimal place in front of them. You can't see it. And this is why in engineering school they always taught us to put a zero before the decimal place so people could see the darn thing. How many of you missed the decimal point? Yeah, hugely painful. Okay, so that's the first thing to get out of the way. Now the second thing is, it's asking for the geometric return on the stock. And we know that return is equal to capital gains yield plus dividend yield. And so we could go through and we could figure out both of these and we could add them together and then we could add one to each one of those and it would be a tremendous pain in the butt. Would you like to see the easy way? Yeah, there we go. By the way, I have this as a video example on Blackboard. So here's what I'm going to do. By the way, we've got four years of data here. How many returns can I get out of that? Three, because you've always got to have the prior year, right? So the returns that we're going to get are for years two, three, and four. Or actually, for, yeah, for years one, two, and three. Well, however you want to think about it. So here we go. What I'm going to do to find out the total return, and the way I'm going to do this is going to actually give us one plus R. The way that I'm going to do this is actually going to give us 1 plus r. Because they're asking for geometric return, what I'm really looking for is 1 plus r. Does that make sense? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the year 2 price and add the year 2 dividend and divide by the year 1 price. And you can, you can work it out algebraically, but it's, that gives us basically the dividend yield plus the uh, capital gains yield plus the original money. So it, it gives us, so that's why it's 1.0 whatever this is. So what we're going to do is I'm going to get my calculator out. And by the way, you really don't have to understand why this works, but this is the method that makes it work. So we're going to say, clear, 
24.9 plus 0.23 equal 25.13. Did you guys get that? Okay, then I'm going to divide by the prior year's price of 23.19 equals. So that's my first 1 plus R. So what do you think I'm going to do with that? Yeah, store 1. By the way, it really doesn't matter what these numbers are over here as long as we know the order. Okay, now the next one, I'm going to take 23.18 plus the dividend I receive at the end of that year, 0.24 equals, and then what am I going to divide by? Yeah, I divide by 24.9. Now, why is this number less than 1? It's 1 plus R. Why is it less than 1? Because return is negative. Does that make sense? What am I going to do with this number? Store 2. Okay, finally I'm going to take 24.86 plus 25 cents, 0.25, equals, and then what am I going to divide by? 23.18. 23.18, right? 23.18. 1, 8, equal. And so that's my third 1 plus r. What do you think I'm going to do with that? Store three. Yeah, store 3. Now, how am I going to get that product of 1 plus r times 1 plus r times 1 plus r? As I say, recall 1 times, recall 2 times, recall 3, equals. Now, what's the next step? Y to the X, open parentheses, what? One divided by how many? Three, three very good. So we only have three returns. Close parentheses, equal. Now what should I do? Subtract one, and then multiply by 100%, gives us 3.36%, which at 3.4% is the closest one to that. So, why does this work? Because at the end of the year, the money you receive represents 1 plus R times the amount that you would have paid at the beginning of the year. And always go to the prior year to get the price. Some people want to keep dividing by 23.19. I don't know why. Questions? Okay. Now we're on to chapter 11. Go ahead. Um, what if we don't get dividends? We just don't add it? Okay, yeah, exactly. So what, what would that equation look like? So all you'd be doing then is taking 24.90 .19, divided by 23.19, store 1. Okay. Um, 23.18 divided by 24.90, store 2. Okay, okay. And then 24.86 divided by what? Uh, yeah, 23.18. Yeah, and then store 3. Okay, I and have then yeah, those notes will get you. <laughs> Folks, if you ever have confusions about things, just feel free to email me. This isn't about like this question, but I know in the notes we went over um, like the graph of the different uh, you know stocks and bonds and their returns and, and yeah. all the practice service questions. Should we expect questions on the test for that too? About who the gets graph. who gets higher returns? Yeah, or like yeah, you, you don't know, need to know numbers. Okay. But for instance, I could ask you what's more risky, a small stock or a corporate bond? Yeah. What's more risky, a small stock or a large stock? A small stock. Uh, small stocks have a higher return because they are blank than larger stocks. Riskier. Does that make sense? Those are the kind of questions you can expect to see. Okay. Now we're moving on to chapter 11. And uh, number two is our first. 
You have a portfolio that has 3,200 invested in stock A, 4,200 invested in stock B. If the expected returns on these stocks are 12% and 15% respectively, what's the expected return on the portfolio? First of all, we know that an expected return on a portfolio is simply the weighted average of the uh, components. And so the first thing that we're going to do is figure out what those weights are. And we have these two things, and this is the, the only two things that are in there. How am I going to find the total value of this portfolio? I'm just going to add them together, right? So I've got 3,200 plus, let's see the other one, 4,200. And I think that's 7,400, is that right? Okay. Now, to find uh, the weight on stock A, it's just going to be the amount in stock A, which is 3,200, divided by 7,400. Is that, are we okay so far? Now, X sub B is going to be 4,200, divided by 7,400. Let's go ahead and calculate those out. So, get the calculator here. And we're going to say 3,200 divided by 7,400 equals. Now, I'm going to use these weights later, so I'm going to store them. This is store one. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and write that right here. I'm storing that in location one. And it's 0.432. Now, I'm going to take the other one, which is 4,200 divide by 7400 equals, what should I do with this number? Store two. Store two. Now, here's a quick check of your work. Recall one plus recall two. If I hit equal, what should it be? One. one. Very good. If it's not, you've made a mistake. And my most likely mistake would have been <coughs> putting that total value in my head. Uh, I can do it. You guys might not be able to. Use your calculator, right? Okay. So, we're good to go so far. The expected return of this portfolio is equal to x of a times the expected return on an a plus x of b times the expected return on b. So, we know that this is in location one. We know this is in location two. So, what did they say the expected return on a is? 12%, and this one's 15%. Now, here I could use decimals, or I could put it the way that it is. It doesn't matter, because I'm not multiplying these things by anything but the weights. But if you're unsure, what should you do? Decimals. decimals. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this in our calculator. Um, I'm going to say, recall 1 times 12 equals. And I can do a couple of things here. One, I could store this, right? I could store it as three, and then I could just do something like this. I think this is the easiest way for me, at least. And then the other one is I could say recall, let's see, store three, just to make sure I've got it. Then I'm going to say recall two times 15 equal, and I'm going to say store where do you think I'm going to store? Four. four. Very good. And I'm going to make a note on my scratch paper that this is number four. So now, to find the expected return on the portfolio, what do I have to do? Yeah, so it's recall three plus recall four equals. I'm getting 13.70%, which is what they get. Does that make sense? Okay. Then, so that's number two. Next one's number five. Oh wow, good stuff. Okay, so calculate the expected return of the two stocks and calculate the standard deviation of the two stocks. Is there any more than that? No. Okay, good deal. Okay, so how do I find, I'm gonna erase some stuff here. How do I find the expected return on the stocks? Any ideas? Probability times rate of return. Yeah, probability times rate of return. And so for stock A, it's going to be 0 0.16 times 
times the return is uh, 0.04. Um, and this is stock A, so then plus what's the probability of normal? 0 0.61 times 0 0.08 plus yeah, 0 0.23 times 0 0.15. By the way, what do all those probabilities have to add up to? 100, yeah, one or 100 percent. Okay, so let's let's work through this. Um, 0.16 times 0.04 equal store one. 0.61 times 0.08 equals store 2. Point 0.23 times 0.15 equals store 3. How do I get the sum of those? Add it up, recall, one, two, three. Recall plus, recall 2, plus, recall 3. I'm getting 0 0.0897, which is exactly what they're getting, right? Okay. So, um, let's go ahead, we will go ahead and figure out the standard deviation for this one, and then we'll go back and take a look at the other one. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to store this in location 0. I'm going to store this in location 0, and here's why. I've got to subtract that thing from each of these returns to get the deviation. Okay, so here we've got the returns, we've got the deviations, and then, what are we going to do, by the way, this is uh, what, x minus x bar, you know, basically. What do we do next? Square it. Yeah. And then what's the last step? Square root. Multiply. Yeah. Probability times deviation squared. And then when we're done, we're just going to add all of those together. And so what I'm going to do in my calculator, how many returns do we have here? Three? I'm going to have these things stored, location one, location two, location three. And I'm going to start, and for each one of these, I'm going to work my way this way, each one. And when I'm done, I'm going to have these all stored up, and then I'm just going to add them together. That's going to give me the variance. How do I get the standard deviation from variance? Square root. Square root. I love how. It, and it's, it's international. If I'm teaching my Chinese students, they do the same thing. With the finger in the air. Right? Okay, so back to the story. Let's work through this. So we have our first return, 0.04 minus the mean, which we have stored in zero. There's your first deviation. So that's right here. Now, what do I do with that deviation? Square it. What happened to the negative? It goes away because we're squaring it, right? Negative times a negative is a positive. The final step is to multiply by the probability. What's the probability of that state of the economy? 0.16. Equal. Now what should I do with that number? Ooh. Store one. Okay, we're going to square root the sum of those three. Okay, now I can clear out. Uh, the next one, the return is 0.08. Minus, recall zero, equals, and then uh, what do I do? So that puts us right here. Yeah, I gotta square that. And then what do I have to do? Yeah, times the probability, and the probability here is 0 0.61 equal. Then what do I need to do with that number? Store two. Clear. And then finally, we've got 0.15. What should I do next? Minus what? Call zero, very good. And then what do I do with that number? Square it. And then what do I do? Multiply by 0.23, equal. And what should I do with that number? Store three. Now, to get the variance, I'm going to add all those together. So here we go. Recall one plus, recall two, plus, 
recall three equals. That's the variance. How do I get the standard deviation? Square root. I'm getting 0 0.0359 multiplied by 100% and there you go. Okay, now, do I need to do it for the other stock also? That's enough? Okay. Letter number seven. You own a portfolio equally invested in a risk-free asset and two stocks. If one of the stocks has a beta of 1.59 and the total portfolio is equally risky as the market, what must the beta be for the other stock in your portfolio? So this one tests a couple of things. It tests uh, whether you know that the beta of the risk-free asset is zero. And what's the beta of the market? One. One. And the other thing it's testing is that you need to know that the beta for a portfolio is the weighted average of the betas in the portfolio. Okay, so it says that the overall beta of the portfolio is equally risky as the market. So one is equal to uh, let's see, so we've got a risk-free asset and two stocks. And so one of the stocks has a beta of, oh no, let's, let's actually, let's make the, the mystery stock. Is, uh, so we're going to, sorry, let's choose the mystery stock is going to be stock A. And so we're going to say beta <coughs> sub A. And then we're going to have the other stock is beta sub B. And then uh, the beta of the risk-free asset. But we know that the risk-free asset, this beta is how much? Zero. Zero. And so this weight on the risk-free asset, does it even matter how much it is? No. OK, so then uh, we, they also tell us that the beta of the other stock is 1.59. And so basically, what we've got to figure out here, they're asking for what must be the beta for the other stock. So what's missing here? So we need x sub a, and we need x sub b. And we know that x sub a plus x sub b plus r, uh, x sub rf has to be equal to 1 when you add all those together. Now notice it says that they are equally invested. Equally invested. If I'm equally invested in three different things, two stocks and a risk-free asset, what's the weight on each one? One divided by three. And so this is one third, this is one third, and this is one third. But as we pointed out, this whole thing doesn't matter. So what we're down to now is that one is equal to beta uh, a over 3, that's our mystery beta, plus 1.59 over 3. So now all I've got to do is the math, and we can figure out what beta sub A is. Have I lost anybody yet? Okay. So isn't that the beta A is easy to get beta A, so you just put it? Yeah, so it's, it's the mystery one, and in uh, algebra, the thing that you don't know, we, we come up with something for it. I could have put something else there, but it's the mystery beta. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is get all the numbers on one side. And so I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how much this thing is, and then I'm going to subtract that from both sides. So here we go. 1.59 divided by 3 equals 0.53. Uh, now, when I move that across the line, what do I have to do? Yeah, I've got to subtract, so I'm going to just say negative, and then I'm going to add the one that's on the other side. And so now I've got 0.47 is equal to beta A over 3. What do I do to get beta A by itself? Yeah, I've got to multiply by 3, right? Multiply by 3, bada bing, bada boom, there it is. So you had to know two things. 
that when we say that it's equally weighted among these three things, that it's the weight's going to be one third. And you had to know that, well, you had to know more than three things. So you had to know that it's going to be a weighted average of the betas. You also need to know that the beta of the market is one, and the beta of the risk free rate is zero, the risk free asset. Questions? Why is the beta of the risk free asset zero? Because it's risk free. Because it's risk free. Very good. Thank you. Stock has a beta of 1. The expected return on the market is 10%. The risk free rate is 3%. What must the expected return on this stock be? Okay, we, have we been given the market risk premium or the expected return? Sorry, um, not to waste time. Does anybody have difficulty with this question? Someone did or they wouldn't have asked. No, it was me. It was you! Yes, I just wanted to make sure because okay. we, I went over it and I understood, so I just I don't want to waste time on okay. it. Okay, anybody else want this one? Mr. Murs oh, okay. does. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, we just wasted our time there. Finance, no, we're wasting our time. Okay, so I'm going to take the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. That's my first step, right? That's going to give me the market risk premium. What am I going to do with the market risk premium? What do I multiply it by? Beta. Beta. And so my market risk premium here is 7%. The beta is 1. So that second part of the equation is just 1 times 7, which is 7%. And then I have to add what to get the expected return? Yeah, the risk-free rate. So I'm going to add 3, and that's going to give me this expected return of 10%. It's just the security market line, Mr. Mers. OK. Do you still want number 9? Pardon? Okay. Oh, oh, this one's tricky. Yeah, this is. And I'll show you why this one's tricky. Expected return on the stock I is equal to the risk free rate plus the beta on stock I times the expected return on the market minus the risk free rate. Do they give us the market risk premium? No. No. If they had, it would be really easy, right? We just solve for R sub F. But R sub F actually shows up how many times in this equation? Twice. Twice. Dude, we're going to have to whip out algebra here. So what's the first thing that I'm going to do? I'm going to distribute this beta into here. So the expected return on stock I is equal to the risk free rate plus beta sub i times the expected return on the market uh, minus beta sub i, oh actually plus, right? Because, oh, no, 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 it's minus. Minus beta sub i times the risk free rate. Have I blown anybody's mind yet? Just about, but you can continue. What's that? I said just about, but you can continue. Just about, okay. Well, all I did was distribute this. So it's going to be this times this and this times this. That's all I did. Nothing that I'm asleep. It's, it's all kosher. Okay, back to the story. Uh, now the next thing I want to do is I want to collect terms. I want to get all of my R sub Fs on one side and all my other crap on the other side. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say expected return on the stock minus beta sub i times the expected return on the market. You see what I did there? I just subtracted this from both sides. And now I'm going to say that's equal to R sub F minus beta sub I times R sub F. Now we're going to do the opposite of this uh, distributing that we did earlier. We're going to collect some terms here. And I'm going to say, I'm going to leave this all the same. And on this side, I'm going to say this is equal to R sub F times 1 minus beta sub I. Did you see how I did that? I just pull this R sub F out, and then in order to make that work, I say R sub F, and then I take both these terms and divide them by R sub F, and that gives me 1 minus beta sub I. And so now I've got all of this junk is equal to R sub F uh, times 1 minus beta sub I. What is the last step that I need to do to get R sub F by itself? Minus divide by, right? And so I'm going to say R sub F is equal to the expected return on the stock minus beta i times the expected return on the market 
divide by 1 minus beta sub i. Okay, now what is 1 minus beta sub i? Down here on the bottom, what is beta sub i? What's beta at the top? Yeah, so on the bottom we're going to have 1 minus 1 1.8. And on the top, uh, the expected return of the stock is 13%. And by the way, as long as we do it all in percents, we're fine here. 13% minus beta sub i, which is 1.8, times... The expected rate is 9.5. Okay. Now this is cool. You're like, whoa, that's going to be negative. Yeah, so is this going to be 2? If we get the other way, they would both be positive. But does it matter? Not one bit. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, let me do that bottom part first. Uh, 1 minus 1.8 is equal to minus Point eight. Sounds easy enough. I'm going to store that as number two because it's on the bottom. Let's do the top part. What part of this should I attack first? Yeah, I'm going to do uh, so the order of operations, parentheses, exponents, uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. How do you remember that? It's PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Right? That's how you remember that. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. I don't know what she did. Maybe she farted at the dinner table. I don't know. But if it helps you remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this first, and I'm going to do that as negative, and then I'm going to add that to 13%. Okay, so I'm going to do uh, 1.8 times uh, 9.5 negative equals. So that's the that second part. And then I'm going to add 13. That gives me the top part. Now, what am I going to divide by? Divide by recall 2, right? That's where I stored that. And that gives me 5.125, and they say 5.13. Now, I suppose in a person's world who didn't really know algebra at all, what they could do is just put the numbers in first and do the numbers out and then solve it for our Sabbath with some addition, subtraction, you know, whatever. But this is the way that it should be done with algebra. Questions? Okay, that's number nine. Okay, so that gets through. So now we're on to chapter 11, homework. And number three. If you have a two stock portfolio with an expected return of 11.7%, stock A has an expected return of 13.8%, stock B has an expected return of 9.2%. Uh, What's the portfolio weight of stock A? Now, at first you say, wait a minute, he hasn't given me enough information to solve this. But we know something. What do we know that all the weights must add to? One. And so we're going to use that fact to our advantage. There it is. So they're telling us that the expected return on the portfolio is 11.7%. And they're wanting to know the weight on stock A. And so that's equal to X of A times, what's the return on stock A? 13.8 plus 1 minus X sub A. Because after all, we know X sub A plus X sub B is equal to 1, right? And so if we solve that for X sub B, we get X sub B is equal to 1 minus x sub a. Does that make sense? And so all I have to do is plug in 1 minus x sub a over here. And what's the return on that one? 
Okay, now notice the percentages here. I'm just going to scratch all those out so they don't have to keep writing that. They all cancel. So we've got 11.7 is equal to 13.8 x sub a uh, plus 9.2 minus 9.2 x a. Very good. So now I'm going to collect terms. And so all I'm going to do is uh, subtract 9.2 from both sides. And then, uh, what's 13.8 minus uh, 9.2? I believe it's what, 4.6? Is that right? 4.6x sub a. And so, uh, what is 11.2 minus 9.5? I think it's what, 2.5? Is that correct? And so, x sub a is just going to be 2.5 divided by 4.6. Let's make sure that's right. 2.5 divided by 4.6. There we go. Any questions? Okay. Next one. Number four. A portfolio has a beta of 1.27 and the portfolio consists of 25% U.S. Treasury bills, 38% stock A, 37% stock B. Stock A has a risk level equivalent to that of the overall market. What's the beta of stock B? This looks a whole lot like that practice one we just did. Do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. What's the beta of the risk-free asset? Zero. 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 What's the beta of the market? One. one. Um, do you want to? Do you still want me to work through this one? No. Okay. On to number eight. What's the variance of a portfolio consisting of $3,500 in stock G and $6,500 in stock H? Here's the first thing I'm going to tell you. Some of you are freaking out. You're like, oh man, I've got to figure out everything for each of these stocks. Wrong. Wrong. We're going to figure out uh, the, the returns on the portfolio, the expected return on the portfolio, and then we're just going to treat that like a stock. And actually, I have an example video on that, but here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and erase all this stuff. If anyone here would invent an auto erasing whiteboard, that would be great. Okay, so we have boom and we have normal. And we have our probabilities here. Probability is uh, 0.15 and 0.85. I went ahead and converted them to decimal places because we know we're going to have to have them that way. And then we've got the return, uh, rates of return, if those states occur. And so we've got stock G and H. So return on G, return on H. And those returns are 15%. Uh, percent and actually, let's go ahead and make those decimals too. This is going to be one of those cases where we need the decimals. 15% and the second one is 8%. And then for the second one, we have 0 0.09 and 0 0.06. Does that look right? Yes. Okay. Now, here's the trick. They've already given us information that we can calculate the weights on these things, did they not? Yeah, and so you got 3,500 in stock G, you got 6,500 in stock H. If you add 3,500 and 6,500 together, what do you get? 10,000. 10, so if I take 3,500 divided by 10,000, I know that the weight on G is equal to how much? 35. Yeah, 0 0.35, and the weight on H is 6,500 divided by 10,000, 0.65. If I add those two weights together, what do we get? One, that's a check for your work, right? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out the return of the portfolio in each of these situations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 0.35 times 0.15 plus 0.65 times 0.09. And that's going to be my return on the portfolio in that state. So let's get that done. By the way, if you run into one of these, one of these on the exam, what should you do? Zero Skip cost. it. Very good. Okay, so 0.15 times 
equal plus open parenthesis point oh nine times point six five close parentheses equal. I'm getting eleven point one percent. Is that what you guys are getting? Okay. Okay, for the other one, we just do the same thing in the other state of the economy. And so I'm gonna say uh, oh yeah. I'm gonna say point oh eight times point three five equal plus open parenthesis point oh six times point six five six five close parentheses equal. I'm getting point oh six seven. Is that what you guys are getting? If you're not punching along, there's no way you can know, right? Okay. Okay, whew. Now, here's the fun part. If I've done everything right, I can totally forget all this crap. I can totally forget it if I've done everything right. And here's why. Now we're going to treat the portfolio as if it is a single stock. And so all I'm going to do is figure out the expected return of the portfolio overall is equal to 0 0.15 multiplied by 0 0.111 plus 0 0.85 times 0 0.067. Okay, so let's get our calculator. So we've already got this 0 0.067 here. I'm going to say multiply by 0.85. Equal plus open parenthesis. Now I'm going to do the other side. 0.15 times 0.111 close parentheses equal. I'm getting 0 0.0736. By the way, this number that we get has to be somewhere between these two. That's another check on your work. So the expected return on the portfolio is equal to. 0 0.0736. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to store that in location 0 because we're going to subtract that to get our devia deviations. So I'm going to say store 0. Now, how do I find the deviation here? All I'm going to do is take 0 0.111 minus recall 0. And then I'm going to square that. And then I'm going to multiply that by a probability. And I'm going to store that. So we're going to have store of location one and location two. Okay. So uh, let's see here. 0.111 minus recall zero. What do I do now? Square it. And what do I do now? Multiply by how much? 0.15 equals, and what am I going to do with that? Store. Store one. Okay, uh, the other one, 0.067, what do I do now? Minus, Minus. we'll call zero, equal, what do I do now? Square. Square it, and then what do I do? Times, Times 0.85, very good. And what do I do with this number? Store. Store two. Now I'm going to hit recall one plus recall two equal. And that's going to give me this number right here. If I ask you to give me the standard deviation, what would you do? Square. Square. So we'd square root that. If I ask you for the standard deviation in percentage, what would you do? Multiply by 100%. Questions? Okay. Now we're on to check five. Chapter five, practice. Lay Corporation has bonds on the market with 16.5 years to maturity, yield to maturity of 7.7%, a par value of 1,000, and a current price of 1,065. These bonds make semi-annual payments. What must be the coupon rate on these bonds? So, get your calculator out. We are going to say second clear TVM. 
What's the face value of any bar bond, unless I tell you otherwise? Thousand. Thousand. That goes in future value. And they tell us this is semi-annual bonds. It's got 16.5 years to maturity. What do I need to do with that number? Yeah, I got to multiply it by two. 16.5 times two should be 33. It is. There we go. And now, 7.7%. Uh, what should I do with that number? Yeah, divide by two. And I'm going to hit I per Y. And uh, let's see, a current price of 1065 What's that going to be? Yeah, that's going to be, first of all, PV. Yeah, yeah but I'm going to make it negative, right? Mm -hmm. Got to make it negative. Uh, PV, and then what am I going to compute? Payment. Payment. Now, it says 42. And technically, what we say is that it's the percentage times 10, right? Um, so this would be 4.2, but is that correct? No, no why not? Semi-annual. The, the actual annual coupon here is 84, right? And so we're looking at 8.4 percent. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Treasury bills are currently paying 9 percent and the inflation rate is 2.9%. What's the approximate real rate of interest? Now, I asked for approximate in the practice. Should you use it on the exam? No. Absolutely not. Okay, so it's just going to be 9 minus 2.9. Because remember, we're saying the approximate is R, uh, little r plus h. And so all I have to do is take big R minus h, and that is roughly little r. So that's the first part. Uh, the second part is uh, uses the real Fisher effect which is 1 plus big R is equal to 1 plus little r times 1 plus h. And we're looking for little r, aren't we? And so we're going to take uh, both sides, divide by 1 plus h. And that makes it look like this. And then what can I do? Minus Yeah, minus 1 on both sides. That's going to take that away. So all I've got to do is take 1 plus big R divided by 1 plus H. Let's get that. 1.09 divided by 1.029 equals subtract 1 multiplied by 100%. I'm getting 5.93%. Now, I always, when I write this formula down, I always write it down with the big 1 plus r is equal to 1 plus little plus little r times 1 plus h because it makes the algebra easier. You don't have to like, oh, no, 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 no. Just leave it that way and then it makes the manipulations easier. Okay, that's number four. Now we're on to chapter six. And we're looking at practice number five. What? That's not the right one. Come on. Chapter six practice. There we go. Antiques for us is a mature manufacturing firm. They just paid a dividend of ten dollars and fifteen cents. Is that P -Z uh, D0 or D1? D0. D zero. Uh, but management expects to reduce payout by 4% indefinitely. If you require a 15% return on this stock, what would you pay for a share today? And so we know that R is equal to D1 over P0 plus G. Does that look right? There's a problem. We don't have D1. What am I going to do about that? Yeah. So it's D0 times 1 plus G divided by P0, and that's plus G. Okay, so G shows up twice here. And what they're telling us, we've got all these numbers. So uh, R, they're telling us 15%. And by the way, I've got to use decimals here because, bam, look at that. That's going to come out as a decimal. So D1 over P0. Actually, we're going to go straight on to 
this stuff. D0, how much is D0? 10.15 um, times 1 plus G. How much is G here? 4. 4, but what direction? Negative. Negative, right? So it's 1 minus 0.04. Does that make sense? And then what's the current share price? Oh, what's up, what's up what we're trying to find? Damn, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so uh, let me rearrange this. The numbers are all the same. I'm just going at it with a different, with a different algebraic arrangement of the formula. So we know that P sub 0 is equal to, um, this is constantly growing dividends, right? And so we're going to look at D1 over R minus G. Does that look right? But D1, we actually know, is D sub 0 times 1 plus G divided by R minus G. Okay, D sub 0, how much is it? 10, 15. 15. Times 1 minus 0 0.04. And now, how much is the required return? 15%. 15%. And so 0 0.15. And here's what really trips people up. Minus minus 0 0.04. What happens to those two minuses? Cancel. Yeah, they, they, they cancel out. And so down on the bottom, we actually have 0 0.19 is what we're dividing by. So we've got 10.15 times 0 0.96 divided by 0 0.19. Let's see if that works out. 10.15 times 0 0.96 equals divide by 0 0.19. One nine equals. We get fifty-one dollars and twenty-eight cents. So the the thing that really freaks people out here is that the growth, the dividend growth rate, can be negative. Questions. And a firm with declining dividends can still be valuable because even though those dividends are getting smaller, each one of them still has a positive present value. Now let's go to the homework numbers nine and ten. Turnips and parsley, common stock sells for thirty-one sixty-five. Market rate of return nine point five. The company just paid their annual dividend of a dollar twenty. What's the growth rate of their dividend? Oh man, do they give us D zero or D one? D zero. D zero. Those jerks. So basically, we're using this formula here. We're going to have to solve that for G. And G shows up twice. This tends to blow people's minds. Now, let's see what we can do with this. First thing I'm going to do is multiply both sides by R minus G. Does that make sense? We'll multiply both sides by R minus G. R minus G. And that's going to get rid of this down here. Next thing I'm going to do is distribute. So I've got P sub 0 R minus P sub 0 G. Have I blown your mind yet? Okay. And on the other side, that's going to be D0 times 1 plus D 0 G. Okay. Any idea what we should do next? Yeah, we're going to collect the terms, right? And so I'm going to say P 0 0 R, my handwriting is so far, I think you can tell what that is. P 0 R minus D sub 0 is equal to, I'm going to add that across the line, D 0 G plus P 0 G. Unfortunately, my D's and P's look a lot alike. Did it mess it up? Like dog. Yeah, it does. It does. I saw that too when I thought about my dogs. Okay, back to the story. Uh, now we've got to get G by itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect that G over here. G D0 plus P0 
And that's going to be equal to that stuff. And so what's the last step? Oh, come on. It's P0R minus P0G. Oops, sorry, no, no, no. Minus D0, right? D0 minus D0. And I'm going to divide by D0 plus P0. Oh, man. Do I have to plug this in, or do you want to move on to the next one? OK. Now, number 10. By the way, if you see that one on an exam, uh, basically, have, a, have this on your note sheet. Does that make sense? Oh, they just announced, uh, they just paid $1.25. Is that D0 or D1? D0. They have a policy whereby the dividend increases 2% annually. You'd like to purchase 100 shares of this firm, uh, but you realize you're not going to have the funds to do so for another three years. If you desire a 12% rate of return, how much did you expect to pay for 100 shares when you can afford to buy this stock? And gracefully, they've told us to ignore trading costs. Now, um, Basically, you've got to keep in mind that the value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows. Remember also that we do not get D0. We do not get D0. But the other person gets D0. Why do they give it to us then? They give it to us because we're going to use it to figure out uh, basically D1. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out what is this worth today? And the value. They say it grows at a constant rate. They say the dividend grows at a constant rate. Yeah, 2% annually. And so we know that P sub 0 is equal to D1 over R minus G. And that's equal to D0 times 1 plus G divided by R minus G. D0, how much is it? 1.25. Yeah, 1.25. And that 1 plus G is 1.02 because the growth is 2% per year. And then on the bottom, we're requiring a 10% rate of return, or 12% rate of return is 0.12, minus the growth rate of 0.02, gives us 0 0.10 on the bottom. You okay so far? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and put that in my calculator. 1.02 times 1.25 equal divide by 0.1 and I'm getting twelve dollars and seventy five cents. Does that make sense? Is, is anybody else getting that or are you guys bothering to play along at all? Nobody's playing. Oh, you did? Excellent. Okay. Now we know that that's P0 and we want P3. You remember that formula I told you? Where P sub x is equal to P sub y times 1 plus g to the x minus y. If I want to find out what P3, what the price is going to be three years from now, which I think is what they're asking for, isn't it? Yeah. Then all I've got to do is multiply by 1 plus g to the third power. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to store that in location 1 just in case everything goes horribly wrong. I'm going to hit 1.02 y to the x3 <coughs> equals multiply by recall 1 equals. So I'm seeing that it's $13.53 a share. Is that what the question asked? No, what does the question ask? Yeah, if you're going to buy 100 shares, how much money are you going to need to have? So we've got to multiply that by 100. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Whew! And we did it. I was like only five seconds late there.